All right, great, thanks. Well, it sounds like everybody heard me, so maybe not a reason to repeat uh, things. And just before I get started, as a point of order, I made the comment that Amanda wanted someone from the group to do a, give a two to three minute report um, when we get back together again on what the group discussed. So any volunteers or shall I draw out of a hat? Good crowd, nobody, nobody <laughs> volunteering. So I'll pull out of the hat. Gene, are you up for maybe being our reporter? Sure. Okay. I um, just, and again, that's called, that's called voluntold. You just there you go. That's right. That's right. That's that West <laughs> my West Point background in the Army, knowing that nobody volunteers. No good deed goes unpunished, but should be very short and just sort of highlight it. Um, but let me open it up a little bit. So the goals again, hopefully you have that in front of you, but for the group in general, do you uh, agree with the proposed goals? Is there anything that needs to be refined or maybe isn't covered? Is it, is it possible that you could put um, the document up so we could just all look at it? Is that possible? Dan, is that possible to, to put up? We're going to put up the goals for the person-centeredness and inclusivity. All right, while he's working on that, maybe Greg, if I could call on you, Greg Simon, just overarching your thoughts about the goals. Yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, my video is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm frantically searching around. It's the usual conflict between all the different video permissions on my computer. Sure. So it's not sure. working, um, but, I, but you can hear me okay, I think. It's loud and clear. Yeah, and, and, and I, I think the, um, yeah, certainly s support these goals and, you know, my very short, um, you know, sort of summary that that, you know, other people have heard me say is I think too often when we talk about, uh, you know, um, uh, person centered research, uh, community engaged research, it's a it's a pretty downstream question. You know, it's essentially researchers saying, how can you help me to do what I want um, as opposed to upstream? What should I actually be doing? Um, you know, and I think that's in some ways more what I heard Terrace King saying that, you know, you really have to engage about what work should be done rather than just saying, I've already decided what should be done. Now I want you to help me do it. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Um, yeah. Melvin, anything you want to throw out to kick us off? Oh, Howard, no, I don't have anything at the moment. Okay, good. I'll just add in, you know, one of the things we've been struggling with at Sarah Cannon as we've been talking about inclusivity and we've talked about, so we've talked about the stakeholders and we've talked about, you know, how do you make sure the payers and pharma are at the table along with the physician scientists and the support wow. staff and the nurses. But we've also with the diversity equity inclusion initiative have gotten into very specifically as we look at the makeup um, and I can speak about this from an ASCO perspective. When we look at our Avail workshop attendees, we actually, when we think about people of color being included, we actually have a fair number of um, Asian, Southeast Asian, Indian, pick, pick your vernacular, that are actively engaged in the sciences. And yet we have a too, too few, a paucity of African-Americans that are, you know, care providers across a number of, of the diseases, particularly in cancer. But, you know, as we think about this issue of uh, being trustworthy and we think about uh, transparency, um, I, I know in serving our patients, the idea of having people that have the same cultural experience as you, look like you, lived your life a little bit, um, really helps people participate in clinical trials. So, um, that's just something to throw out there. We, we've been trying to invest in back up, way back up the food chain in terms of getting more African Americans interested in coming doctors and nurses and the like. So I just throw that out on the inclusiveness point of view. I don't know if anybody wants to react to that, but I think that's a specific piece to consider. One of the, the challenges for trying to engage the community is um, that it can be hard to identify who really is the community. That, that the people who volunteer very often have a self interest and not an interest of the broad community. And we've had a tendency to choose advocates who were say hired by a disease foundation, 
but they're actually professional advocates. They're lobbyists who may have had a condition, but they're effectively lobbyists. And what you really want to have is people who reflect those who are affected, but particularly in acute diseases, it may be very hard to identify those people, or you see them in retrospect after they've um, gotten past the disease. So they're a subset of the subgroup. It's really hard um, to get the community identified so that you're being effective. And we, in the HIV experience, we got a lot of activists who were very knowledgeable, but they did not represent the broad community. Um, and I don't know that we ever solved the problem of getting to the broad community. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. So, uh, I wanna add a couple of things on that point. Um, one is the best practices in community engagement, whether it's research or public health interventions are known. And we don't have, you know, they could be improved upon, but we don't need to reinvent them. Um, if we could get a long way just by looking at those and implementing them, um, you know, the things, uh, well, inclusion is just one aspect of it, engaging with the community, listening to the community, to what the community actually needs. Um, and one thing that hasn't been called out yet that I think speaks to some of the challenges that, that um, Ross has raised and Howard too, um, is the if you're genuinely interested in working with a community and genuinely interested in saving Black lives, you need a long-term commitment to being engaged with that community. And if you have that, then you don't have to wonder when a crisis comes up or when a particular research project comes up um, who the best people are because you have an existing understanding and set of relationships with the group that you're trying to work with. And that's a big, big, big ask. I recognize that. But I think that's, I, that's the ideal. I don't know if there's a way to, to think about that and to try and move in that direction. But, you know, whether it's health or public health or research or development, you know, there's there are innumerable cautionary tales of people having one project, whatever it might be, coming in and trying and trying to establish all of that for that one project um, when the crisis comes up, and that that often doesn't work as well as it should. And I think in this instance, we have a long-term obligation to all of the groups in the country. And we should be thinking, if we're thinking long-term, we should be thinking about a long-term, more fully-fledged infrastructure for that engagement. And I wanted to say one other thing while I have the floor. Um, inclusion is really important. It's, it's exactly right to be working way, way upstream. In the meantime, understand that the people the, the small, relatively small proportion of representation in the medical and scientific fields now, they have their own careers and they, they probably get called on to do these things all the time because there's not that many of them, right? <laughs> in the grand scheme of things, there's not enough. And so finding a, in the same way that um, we need to respect the time and resource of the people in the community that we're asking to do work for us, we need to make sure that we do that um, for the healthcare people that we call into these things. Yeah, that's good, Carolyn, good. Amy Abernathy, any thoughts? Yeah, you know, as I've been listening, I just wanted to give voice to uh, one inherent tension that I think we need to, to pay attention to, and that's that, um, as we imagine 2020 clinical trials, um, we are constantly thinking about how to make the system more efficient. And making the system more efficient um, often means spending less time talking to real people and underinvesting in the human part of building trust. And so I, I think that building trust and having confidence is a, a lot of what Carolyn said, which is, you know, 
longitudinal relationships and really longitudinal commitment, but it's also commitment in the moment. Moment, And the systems that we imagine building have very little time for commitment in the moment. So that's my, my first um, kind of point. And my second point is that there is also a tension between um, really creating clinical trials and a clinical trial infrastructure that's easy to participate in in all of the extra bells and whistles we add on to each clinical trial. Skip and you and I know this inherently as we think of, about you know cancer clinical trials and and how many hours people can be asked to um, sit and participate or meet even many days or long distances to travel. And so being able to create a clinical trials infrastructure that also means clinical trials people, real people can participate in is going to be really critical to making sure that's inclusive for everybody. And um, that means we've got to sort of maintain a really um, uh, rigid discipline to trying to get rid of a lot of the things that don't need to be there. And, and that's all across our system. I acknowledge that FDA is a part of that conversation too. Well, I'm smiling because I, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, and yet I walked into exam room four yesterday and asked one of my patients. I said, "Wow, I'm surprised you're here so late. Aren't we getting started today?" And she looked at me with like I had two heads. And my nurse practitioner said, "No, no. I mean, she's here today for this and that. And then tomorrow she has this or that. And then Wednesday she's getting treated. And she lives like an hour and a half, two hours away." And I said, "Are we staying here?" And she goes, "Yeah, I'm booked at the." hotel across the street for three days. And I said, what about your son? And she had like a nine-year-old. She goes, well, he's here and with my husband getting taught virtually at the hotel. But, you know, not to belabor that point, I mean, what is an orally administered hormonal therapy for refractory breast cancer is a 72-hour project because of all the bells and whistles. And just lucky that she was motivated enough and the support staff got her lined up. But it is I'm smiling because it is just incredible how much we try to get done in each every in each and every study. Yes. Um, this so, is Jeannie. Can I can I talk about a couple yes. of things you feel strongly yeah. about? Okay, so I'm I'm with a major patient organization called the Longevity Foundation. I was previously yeah. with Merck and Company for a while. And uh, so I have a unique perspective on um, this space in terms of diversity and inclusion in clinical trials. And I've worked with a lot of cancer centers around the country who are centers of excellence who do good work in this space. Um, so first off, um, the training um, for implicit bias is needed in this space um, for all with all stakeholders, researchers, community leaders, community outreach leaders um, in the system. Um, the elephant in the room is that it's, uh, it takes too long and it's too hard and, and it becomes an excuse. So we, we must train leaders in the field who are trying to make a difference to understand implicit bias and uh, the choices that they make um, matter. Um, it matters as leaders what they say, how they say it, um, and um, what it really does make a difference. So it's not just taking the Harvard course, it's actually developing implicit bias training for better inclusion for research overall. The, the other thing I want to say is that um, based on my work with Cancer Centers of Excellence in the United States who are able to accrue racial and ethnic minority populations um, with success, um, it's not just about clinical research. It's about outcomes research. It's about behavioral research, participatory research. It's getting individuals and working with them and getting their input to understand the research process and why it's important for their communities and people like them. So we, we jump to this space of the goal being getting more populations into research um, into clinical research, but we forget it's a it's a journey and it's a process, and we need to pay attention to um, what what people need and want, um, and the process of their their learning and the process of them trusting. So, I, I would implore us to focus not on only on clinical research, but the whole all of research and um, non therapeutic research as well to gain that trust. Um, 
So those are just a couple of things that I wanted to talk about and I'm interested in other people expanding on what I just said. That's great, Gene, thanks. Yeah. Others? Yeah. Hi, hi. Uh, my name is Luca. I'm co-founder, chief data scientist of Evidation Health. Uh, we run uh, very large decentralized uh, studies that have a PGHD person generated health data component. So digitally mediated data access from phone or surveys or sometimes even wearable devices. I really want to echo uh, what uh, uh, Jean, Jean is how you pronounce it. Uh, just, what is that? Jean uh, just said uh, on, uh, on training, uh, I really think that inclusiveness and representativeness should be part of GCP uh, in, in a way that it, it's, it's really non-negotiable. Like it's, it's not that you, know, you, you feel okay to have a convenient sample as long as you have a limitation section on your paper or your report. It really should be that you're bound by your ethical uh, you know, training to, to not stop at non-representative population when you're recruiting. Um, the second point I wanted to make is that I see a, a big parallel between what Pastor King was talking about in terms of real world uh, and the virtual world and the online world where you know we have more experience recruiting uh, at the same in the same level. If you want to reach uh, BIPOC communities, you have to go and partner with online BIPOC communities. You have to go forge partnership with, for example, BlackDoctor.org, because the, you know, one of the most important points I feel in my opinion that Pastor King made is that we don't have a language to talk to these communities. And so you need a translators. Just like when I came to the United States, I didn't know English. I needed a translator. You need to rely on someone else. And so online part, there are online communities that are mostly centered around, uh, you know, um, you know, BIPOC or, uh, you know, community that are not uh, like, like me in terms of color. Uh, and um, and uh, you have to go find them and work with them to be effective at recruiting and engaging uh, BIPOC population. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Luca. That's really well said. Other comments? Hey, it's um, for long. Um, I just wanted okay. to make a comment. How are you? I just wanted to make a comment about pediatric rare diseases. Um, many of them are seeing an really amazing progress and moving into the gene therapy um, clinical trials, which is really terrific opportunities for, for these children who might otherwise have progressive debilitating diseases or die very young. But the, the clinical protocols are set up such that the family has to be nearby to the clinical trial site for depends on the trial. It can be as short as six weeks, and it can be as long as, it, you know, depending on where they live, six months. So those trials are obviously not amenable to, to people without resources and capability and employers and knowledge and, you know, lots of ramifications to who can participate. And Jeannie, what you said about the bias of the researchers as well, how they talk to these people and how they include them because of they, you know, their knowledge of, of the resources they have to, to really adhere to the trial protocols. And one other point is uh, I spent some time in Mississippi because we, we were trying to understand the barriers to participation. And I, and I spent a good deal of time in the Delta. And I think along with, pa with uh, Pastor King's um, opening, going to them and trying to really get to know them and establish trust um, into this population of people, many of whom in this particular area that I was in um, were really relying on their sanctuaries, right? And their barbershops and their local, many of them had, had really lived, um, born, lived and died within a very, um, um, maybe 10 or 15 miles of where they lived. I think that if we're to include people um, that have those cultures and, and um, we want to be inclusive. We need to go there and stay there. And to Ross's um, uh, opinion, it, it is really important. Six months was not enough that my grant was over and I had to leave. But, you know, so I've, I've always felt horrible about that loss of trust that we had established in that education. We were that bi-directional education. We, we were delivering to each other and learning from each other and the ability to really to help each other as we include to diagnose and treat those children in that area. So I, I totally agree with you. Great, thank you. Any, anyone else? I, I just wanna add something that um, 
is is kind of more obvious. So there's so many stakeholders involved in putting together a research project that includes um, diverse and representative populations. So, you know, industry, or whoever the sponsor is, the CRO, um, community leaders, um, the the site head, um, the operations head at sites. Um, and what has really actually never been done is we haven't put everybody all together in the room. Also, patient organizations should be part of that um, thinking and those stakeholders. We haven't put everybody together in a room to kind of map out the process to ensure an inclusive research program for a given disease area. Um, because this is about people, process, technology, decision rights. And, you know, when a sponsor says, hey, you know, here's our process for reimbursing patients for out-of-pocket cost, um, and everybody doesn't understand that, or they don't understand the timing of when that needs to be offered, it does affect, a, you know, it does affect the whole accrual rate of a, of a potential study that wants to include where the goal is to include diverse populations. So, you know, putting everybody in a room and actually designing the process with all stakeholders have actually never really, has never really been done. Good. Are there comments, anyone specifically with a thought around a potential interim milestone that might achieve one of these goals around representation, um, the diverse workforce, or improving transparency, trustworthiness? Yeah, um, hi, this is Helena. Um, I think the first thing I agree with everything that's been made is um, when we engage with community leaders to be clear on uh, the priorities. So in terms of the milestone, maybe choose three things that will have the highest impact for that community, right? Uh, whether it's outcome measures, um, whether it's communication, whether it's information. Um, and the second thing is to be clear on how we measure success. I mean, it has been said, um, you know, the, the tension between clinical trial deficiency versus what's actually meaningful um, to patients and, and the, um, the providers. So even just having measures of goals and success in the near term that we can all align on um, can help for, for the long-term engagement um, based on how that works, you know, we, we can expand um, to larger disease areas uh, and include um, uh, broader initiatives. Good. I was, I was the, the, to me, one of the big challenges here when you talk about milestones is I actually sometimes have a problem with sort of milestones about so-called representativeness of samples um, in terms of requirements on clinical researchers because I think it sometimes reinforces the idea of, you know, the, the researchers have a need and they just have to go find somebody to meet it through whatever means, um, rather than saying, it's important to engage with the communities that we aim to serve regarding what their int long-term interests are. Um, you know, when it's, I, I've written before and I put it in its most indelicate form, it sometimes resembles to me what the people much younger than me would call a booty call you know, which means I've got needs and I'm calling somebody up to meet them rather than I'm interested in a long-term relationship. Um, it's a bit harder to put milestones on, you know, true engagement, long-term relationship, and I care about you now and forever. Um, it, it's it's kind of hard to put a milestone about that, but that's what it's about, I think. Howard, I just want to um, interject real quick. We have about two minutes left. Yep. In, in this session, so we'll be um, going probably back in the main um, room shortly. Great, thanks, Melvin. Any other wrap up comments? I think this was helpful. Feels like the groups. Um, in terms of aligned. milestones, yes. Howard, I, I, you know, I think that we need to obviously incorporate the usual clinical trial metrics, including recruitment rates and, and participation. But one we potentially need to include is is, is trial complexity. Um, because we really are moving towards more and more complex clinical trials in many different ways, as you know, and that's just going to get us upside down. So I, I think one of the things we need to do is be able to measure trial complexity. Um, could I just add another milestone uh, that I think we should think about in the long term moving towards, and that's about 
reporting of who's in the trial. So there needs to be more transparency in research in terms of um, reporting racial and ethnic minorities, age, race, gender, also sexual um, and gender identity. Who are the, who's in the trial? What are the baseline characteristics? They need to be reported as part of the research study. And um, that should be juxtaposed against um, what the epidemiology of the disease is in the United States. Um, so reporting who's in the trial with transparency um, is critical because, you know, right now we really can't tell because um, data is not reported and collected. Um, so I, I think we have a, some work to do in terms of reporting and collecting data on race and ethnicity, as well as sexual and, and gender identity standards. Two more, I know we're short on time, so I'm jumping in. Two more ideas on the subject of long-term engagement, we could think about a milestone that measures um, how or requires the reporting of what the community defined outcomes that matter are with respect to a particular trial. Um, and that ensures that there has been some engagement and that the community has been listened to. Um, and then I don't have an idea for how to measure long-term engagement, some commitment over the long-term. But I think, as I said before, it's important. Uh, a more straightforward one strikes me as being requiring diversity inclusion training for people involved in the trials. Um, I don't think that's that hard to do, and I think it's very measurable. Thanks. Just takes the will. Good, good. So we've got just about a little less than a minute to go. Any other final comments or thoughts? Appreciate all the conversation. Uh, excellent, excellent thinking going on.